MEFC Real Estate TV in the house, Mick Ruby here. Good morning, good afternoon. How are we all doing this scintillating Tuesday morning or afternoon, wherever you are sitting in the world? It's not a live stream, it's a recording, basically, basically, basically. Um, I hope you're not feeling dizzy. I hope you took that motion sickness pills. There's a lot of things spinning on Neil Ashton's plate at the moment. And if you don't know who Neil Ashton is, he is the head of the PR of Manchester United PLC. Hello, hello, hello. By what it matters is we will pause this music because at the end of the day, it is this. Oh my God. Neil, stop playing that music. <laughs> Seriously. The reason why I'm doing this uh, recording is because we've seen it all. We done the lot. And um, it's just a follow up from the podcast that we had yesterday. It's two days after the protest and what's next um, of course we're here to make the due diligence to understand the two bidders uh, the rat versus uh, is it called it the rat race versus the prince the sheikh the savior or easy or easy not but anyway we just have to dissect things as we speak and of course we're going to go back into what Ahmed Shaban said earlier um, so this is just a pre-recorded message and we're going to dissect everything um, guys, uh, welcome to MUFC Realist TV. Now, let's go into look at uh, let's how how we can compare. Look at Al Jazeera, which is not a non-British. Um, magazine we've been looking at a lot of uh, british outlets and reporters reporting things but look at what the actually qataris are saying this is kind of interesting because they're saying two different things like so let's unpack this story from al jazeera that came out the other day i hear you qatar sheikh yasim submits final bid for manchester united right that means that they will disclose an undisclosed figure to to the owners and an additional investment directly to the club. Now, Ahmed will talk about this, um, you know, further up this show as well. What does that mean? But you know, Doha, Qatar, basically by Hafsa Adil, brilliant, brilliant journalist. Uh, been reading his stories before, but uh, Qatari businessman uh, Sheikh Yassim bin Hamad Al Thani. We all know his name by now has submitted a third and final bid to buy manchester united football club his representatives told al jazeera uh, yasim's bid was submitted before friday night 9 pm european time i guess deadline set by the current club owners the glazer family of the united states we can confirm that sheikh yasim's bid has been submitted final bid for Manchester United Football Club, his representatives told Al Jazeera. And this is his representatives, like, you know, speaking directly to Al Jazeera, which is the national newspaper, which is also the global newspapers in certain sense. But you know what? Jasim is the chairman and leading Qatari bank and son of former Qatari prime minister. The lifelong United fans, debt-free bid, well, this is what we like, the debt free bid, which was the first submitted by in February, seeks full ownership of the club. His representative said, in addition of offering an undisclosed figure to buy the club, money to go to the sellers. This is direct money going straight under the table to the glazers. Is that what they're saying? Yazim's proposals also include a plan to further invest significant amount of additional capital and infrastructure investments into the club directly not to the sellers wow this is interesting really this is not really what the british media is reporting they're basically trying to say here that they've gone full package be over the evaluation so basically more money to the glazers but in addition <laughs> directly invest in the infrastructure to the club and the community around 
Now, this is what we're here for. We got to sort of be, do due, due diligence on what the two bidders offer. Maybe it's a rat race, right? Or maybe it's a Formula One race. It is the, what I call it, the potato farmer versus the Ferrari racer in a way, right? Uh, British billionaire Jim Ratcliffe, on the other hand, was the only party to submit a bid before Friday, according to Al Jazeera deadline, according to a report by British state broadcaster BBC. So again, this is the BBC that's been reporting on the British side. Radcliffe, founder and head of Ineos Chemical, chemical uh, Conglomerate, is reportedly seeking 69% ownership of the club. That's a partial, uh, partial sale in a certain way. Um, and same percentage owned by the Glazers. So basically swap, swap like by like, you know, just the <laughs> swap seats, right? The Qatari businessman's bid was submitted through is 92 foundation is it 92 foundation 92 foundation promise a rosy future for the club where to be successful including investments in the football teams the training center the stadium and the wider infrastructure the fan experience and the community the club supports this is music to my ears this is you know <laughs> A wet dream. This is what we want, people, isn't it? Right? The, by proposing to take over Sheikh Yassim's plans to return the club to the former glory days, both on the pitch and off the pitch, hundred percent. And of course, they're throwing in pictures of the protest um, people in green and gold until we sold, right? Uh, but it reflects what they're saying in Qatar's ambition. You see that. Jasim's bid has not come as a surprise to expert, according to that aligns with the country's ambition. They're now talking about what Qatar's ambition is, right? Um, Sheikh Yassim's his interest, according to Manchester United, suggests that Qatar is embarking on the next stage of his ambition, according to Ross Griffin, an assistant professor at Qatar University, whose research includes the portrayal of the Arab world in the Western media and the relationship between sports and post-colonial society. We're going more into the politics as well. <laughs> this is interesting. Qatar's ambition in sport, brackets, is breaking up into two branches, he said. The first will continue on to focus on Qatar hosting sporting events such as Asian Cup in 2024, the Asian Games in 2030, while also potential purchase a Premier Football League club to be part of the second branch. People, if you've been watching my content before, this is what I've been trying to say. Uh, it is the post World Cup, um, you know, um, bloody tooth, I must say, because they spent, you know, billions of building the infrastructure, building railroads, metro stations building stadiums and that was kind of a success right now it is time to put qatar they put qatar on the map and now they just want to have this contingent right because oil and gas will eventually finish so you kind of look at this article to say that yeah this is the plan because we are looking to host other events like you know uh, the asian games and basketballs and mmas and cricket and all that jazz like you know so the Glazers announced the plan to sell the club last November and the bidding process began February. They reported to want to sell the club for six billion pounds. It's about approximately 7.45 million US dollar, which is a record fee for any sporting club, 100%. Yassim representative said, it is now time for the sellers to make a decision as to how they will proceed with the bidding process. So now it's kind of coming out that they are getting anxious. Like we've done everything that you asked for, right? We submitted everything and you actually got more than you asked for, right? We, we actually met your evaluation. It's time to make a decision. The Glazers have not confirmed when the process will close and if the club will change hands at all. Weird, huh? weird. Why would you keep your bidders in the loop so this is kind of um the warning alerts what i want to sort of bring into to like you know compare the apples to apples but you know guys this is just me reading what al jazeera is doing comparing apples to pair apples calling a spade a spade but let's look at yesterday's 
broadcast that we did live with Ahmed Shaban as well, who is a financial business analyst and expert that worked in the banking finance industry in Qatar. Um, let me just uh, say hello to Ahmed Shaban. How are you doing, mate? I'm very, very well. Happy to be with you, Mick. How are you? I'm good, thank you. I'm good. Tired, 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 sir. Very tired. Um, I mean, for me, like, you know, of course, it's, it's always been to protect the badge in a way and protect the media spin because I said this from very first beginning, like, you know, do expect the, the media to spin you dizzy, right? And yeah. remember who sits at the DJ board. It's uh, Neil Ashton, you know, who is in charge of all the PR because any positive PR for the Glazers at the moment and the, it is positive because you generate a lot of money on the clicks, right? Yeah. And sure. it's clear and obvious that they are leaking out information to generate like attraction. And I just tweeted out today, like, you know, a, a DJ on a mad substance spinning his records on 200 DPIs. <laughs> like, you know, uh, don't get the, don't get this, don't, don't be dizzy by the Pied Piper, how they spin the records, like, you know, and, you know, I mean, you can just tell you what, what your background is uh, for the viewers as well, like, you know, and, you know. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm personally, I'm a financial analyst and a business analyst as well, I work for some financial institution. Um, I have quite a few credentials uh, in, in, in project management, statistical analysis and statistical analysis based project management such as Six Sigma and Link. Um, that, that generally my background and my studies and education. So it, a bit familiar with financial markets and activities within it mm. uh, and, and across, you know, across the board of, you know, all the markets, stocks, commodities and yeah six so sigma rocks mate yeah it does it does absolutely it's yeah. all about the elimination and bottlenecks at the end of the day absolutely. isn't it absolutely yes are you black belt i am master black belt in fact. you're master black belt so don't mess with Armin. <laughs> that's perfect right perfect so let's just start like you know with bloomberg which is a financial uh oh, well, what can we say bloomberg is reporting on the right financial stuff right so let's play this this video first like as an as a recap United is up for sale. The Glazer family, United's owner since 2005, has confirmed it's exploring strategic alternatives to enhance the club's growth. To put that simply, it could lead to a partial or full sale of one of the world's biggest soccer clubs. So why would they want to sell now? Well, a big part of it comes down to money. The Glazers believe that the sale could fetch a record-setting deal well in excess of the $4.7 billion that Walmart heir Rob Walton paid for the NFL's Denver Broncos in August. But it isn't so straightforward. The cost of debt is rising, so it may be harder to attract bidders than it was for, say, rival premiership club Chelsea saw back in May. And how do the fans feel? Well, the Glazers have never been more unpopular, but a big concern is who they would sell to. One of the reasons that the Glazers are so disliked is that their initial takeover of the United is debt funded. That means they've had to take more than a billion dollars out of the club over the years to pay interest on that debt, money that could have been spent on the squad or improving the stadium. If they find a buyer who also funds the deal with debt, such as a private equity firm, they may need to take even more money out of the club. For all of their dislike of the Glazers, Man United fans may find themselves in a worse situation. And there you have it. Um, I mean, you, you that understand exactly what uh, she said here, like, you know, with, with, with the equity firm. Um, I mean, she, she kind of unpacked it very, very nicely there, like, to be honest, mate, you know. Yeah, true. So, uh, especially the part that she, when she highlighted the, 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 the problem with the, the, the cost of borrowing rising. Hmm. Can you explain a little bit more in layman terms what that means? Like, right, you know, you coming from the financial banking industry. Well, the, the thing is, when 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 the inflation hits hits record heights, the central banks starts to do an, an opposition to what has been happening that has caused this inflation. What goes inflation is the amount is bit is pending, the 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 money being printed and all of that, which happens happens. Dur during a cycle called quantitative easing and that quantitative easing in a very simple word is that you just print more money and they spend more in order to advance businesses to make the economy flourish and to 
allow faster dynamic of you know the money flow and liquidity flow in order to enable every every corner of the economy to behave and function mm. faster and during the inflation it hits high the opposite happens which is called quantitative tightening and that they strike the economy with something called interest rate so in, in order to go and borrow money that you used to borrow before on, on e, actually in some cases in a zero interest basis yeah. they make it extremely expensive to do that now which 100%. makes a lot of people unable to do that no, 100%. And we are kind of living in a, in a global recession time that's kind of bigger than the recession what you saw 2008. So borrowing money is not the way to go nowadays. Like, you know, as people, normal people like like lads like you and me, um, we, we have to sort of oversee our finances. Like, you know, should we invest money to buy Manchester United kits, uh, invest in tickets, season tickets, or should we choose to put money and food on the uh, money on the food on the table? Right. Um, it is kind of very unprecedented times as, as we speak, but therefore it doesn't make sense um, because if you look at uh, something that people don't uh, talk much about, and I've been talking about it, is that who makes the profit out of this sale, right? Uh, you know, rest assured that the the rain group that they, they, they have a commission rate on top of whatever they're trying to sell, right? I, I don't know, nobody has seen how much, but usually it's about four or five percent, right? It could be. It could be. Um, it could be. Yeah. 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 And then you have the Bank of America, which actually owns the overall bond, the debt of Manchester United PLC, because they have been the ma major credited bank, right? Yeah. So let's break that down, like you know, because Malcolm Glazer basically came in as an investor post two thousand and five, and he had twenty percent of approximately 20% as a minority investor into the club. Now, when you do a minority investment, it's like you buying crypto or any stock um, for long-term investment. You might see this grow, right? Within five years, your stock evaluation, your portfolio has gone up by maybe 30%, whatever. Right. And, but for some default 2005, he got the opportunity to become majority. And this through what you call it a leverage buyout. And what he did was basically borrow money from Bank of America, but not on himself, but use that as a leverage, as an asset, to put it back to Manchester United. So it's basically me going to you, buy your house, <laughs> and putting back the debt on you. Yeah, <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? So it, that is a that is a something that that it, it's criminal, according to my opinion, and something that they got away from, right? Um, yeah. So where we're seeing this where we are now if we're going to bring it to where we are now uh, in a layman's term for the viewers is to say that this media spin to say that we know that glazenomics money talks right at the end of the day um if you were a potato farmer i'm sorry glazes i don't have any sympathy but i call you poor billionaires potato farmers there's a level of, of richness in billionaires club right uh, and glazes are, the, are at the very bottom of that pyramid and then you have multi-billionaires that can control the world you know what i mean um it's like seeds it's crumbs right so basically what they're trying to offer in that case is what they're trying to say here's a couple of seeds you will ha not have any you know voting rights you will not have any um, dividends to take out because what you did for the past 18 years was taking out four times a year it's like dividends payment to feed your cash cow like you know to feed darcy and all that kids and all that jazz right this is what they were using it for basically yeah. They never invested anything into the club whatsoever. And part of what Bloomberg is saying, they, they missed the point is why are they selling the club? Because all of a sudden they're forced, they're forced to dip into their own pockets. They are forced and they're not willing to do that. And therefore they went into a, um, what do you call it? Strategic investment to explore the opportunities. But what's so interesting, Ahmed, is well that during these um, strategic investments, all the bidders and and hedge funds had it was like an open heart surgery right you're allowed to open up the bonnet of your royce royce to look what's under the hood and what you saw there was rusty parts yeah and who would then put in money to a business that's been badly run right you cannot even ha hardly run your finances and if you look at glazes economics back in us it's all tied into assets they're also in financial trouble over there so if somebody then comes in to offer you this like you know here's a couple of seeds hopefully it will rain you might have bad crop but within 10 years 
maybe your hope that the evaluation of the club, what you invested, will be 10, 15 billion. Or option B, Sheikh Yassin comes in, he spent numerous hours overseeing everything, which is called a due diligence uh, checklist, um, which has been going on for the past four weeks, not even because it's Ramadan, because people are actually working there as well, you, including yourself, you work there as well, so you know. You know, there's no Muslims that's part of this team as well that's working, right? Business operation doesn't stand still. So it's been that kind of due diligence uh, checklist protest, uh, checklist during this kind of mini exclusivity. Like, you know, what about this? What about that? What about that? Until you come to a final agreement, which is called the letter of intent. Right? And you know what a letter of intent is, right? Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Yes, we, we so have a for, different word for it. Yeah. So for viewers that don't know what a letter of intent is, that you you kind of come to an almost not a legal agreement, but it's kind of like, okay, we agree on the sales price. We agree what the earner clause will be. We oversaw every single aspect of this whole deal, which is called the package, right? The package. Yeah. Now, it's fi I find it very, very interesting that, you know, the sports, so-called sports journalists on this, came out on Thursday or Friday treating it like a deadline, <laughs> like a transfer deadline. To say that the evaluation is lower of uh, Sheikh Yassin. And I said, well, hang on a second, Mr. Keegan, sorry. What do you mean by evaluation? Well, you looked at the evaluation of the overall, uh, what the club is worth. But what about the rest? What about the package? What about what you're offering um, as a contingency improvement for the Glazers to do business? This is not, nobody's reporting this, right? It, it is just sheer di diabolical for my opinion, because at the end of the day, you, if, if I receive a bid, I mean, I will compare apples to apples and I will always see like, okay, well, this is offering me this lower evaluation of my share prices, right? But this other one offers everything else around and offers me to continue to do business by opening doors for me to do business deals in Qatar, for instance, or fracking. And on the other hand, if you look at Qatar, they are one of the major asset rich in gas and petro petrochemicals in, in the world. And they could easily go to Sir Ineos to say, look, if you let us have this deal, we let you in some projects here to do some fracking or well, into your company. Yeah. So I'm just trying to unpack it, like, you know, to, to say that everything else is just media spin at the moment like you know uh what's gonna to happen next is something that i like to share with you ahmed um this this is the contract and conclusion phase right so during this period of time you know in the bidding sales process you know they, they've been concluding is, is is that share deals and asset deals of course everything is tied into it right this is part of the bidding process right and what we're talking about before is the letter of intent where you have the due diligence checklist. I will just back the slide one, one more, one more slide to say that, you know what, um, it's the due diligence, which is the due diligence uh, checklist. And this is the period you, you have the time to, okay. Um, what about this? What about the share prices? What about the B shares, A shares on that jazz, right? And, and during this period of time, you also submit your shadow directors who is going to be involved in 92 Foundation or Sir Jim, Sir Jim Ratcliffe's team to, that needs to be submitted to the Premier League, um, to the UEFA, to the government and all that, right? Okay, I'm trying to sort of slow myself down because I have too many coffees this morning anyway. Um, so the letter of intent, what, what I'm trying to say is, is basically, you, you then when you come to this stage, is that you agreed on everything, the earner clauses, what, what will be the payouts, right? And the payouts could also be like, how much money are you going to receive tax-free under the table? <laughs> this, this dirty politics, I mean, I, you know, you that been in this industry, have you seen this happening before where you have something called like, you know, um, undisclosure bid, like, you know, what's what's for contingency, like, you know, you would look at, okay, we were going to pay you this much on the share price. But on the other hand, what are you going to receive extra not to paying tax? Because... Manchester United PLC is registering Cayman Island, which is tax-free anyway, right? And plus you have all the siblings. Well, absolutely. I mean, deals like that, um, well, I, I salute the efforts that have been put into this because even with, with the, the specialists, it's not, it's not easy to unpack it completely. It's not easy at all. 
because in deals like that, mergers and partnerships and acquisitions, you have teams, teams from different partitions of the business trying to look after that. You'll have a contracting team, you'll have a legal team, you'll have uh, uh, a business analysis team, you will have a financial team, you will have a lot of teams. And when, when I'm saying uh, teams... And on your shirt, you have team, team viewer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, I, I believe you will have a lot of individuals involved in that in order to unpack it and get to understand the details completely and talk about it and comprehend it. However, um, th that being said, I, I believe it is still for us to, to, we will need more inputs and information from them in mm. order to see things much clearer because everything around it i believe is going to be also speculated but the concept is there and you have laid it very 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 nicely uh, and and the tips are there but in terms of the nature of that acquisition it's not just a business deal there is there is a political aspect of the deal which is not always present in 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 the kind of routine mergers and acquisitions and takeovers I'm not only talking about PR and media, I'm talking about the political side of it. That's the political that's, side, yeah. Yes, it, and it does, does exist. It, 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 it cannot, it should not be undermined. I keep repeating this word. This is the biggest club in the whole world. Yeah, With the is. biggest fan base in the whole world. The biggest sport entity in the whole world. It's not an easy thing to unpack. So. You put the media there, which is if you if you like what happened with Twitter, big company, a lot yeah. of people are interested to know, but that is going to be only media and PR and Manchester United is different. Can I just can you hold my coffee there? Like when you mentioned Twitter, it's it's a great polit it's been political like, weaponized as a political tool for controlling sure. information. So what happened with Elon Musk? Now he owns it and they are pissed off because it's his tool, it's his toy, right? He can do whatever he wants. But yeah. Twitter is not really profitable. They're not making money. And the it's interesting not. part with Twitter is he did a hostile takeover. He looked at the overall evaluation. He put his bid in. But then on the remaining to, to sweeten off the deal, which is the, the, the what do you call it, the earner clause, he bid it $9 over the existing share price for the remaining to do a hostile takeover. And this is how we acquired. So that he ended up buying the bird for 50, 46 billion 46 yeah. billion and it's not even profitable it's just for a tool and then you can see what you know okay he's just owning it and this is kind of similar what uh, i wouldn't say similar but what what sheikh yassim and and um, them trying to do they're not seeing it as a profitable but they're seeing it as a great tool for promoting sports and promoting the region and without any taking any return on investment because we we all cited the manifesto right well, absolutely. I mean, uh, well, Twitter is slightly different because Elon is making it. It's going to, he's going to make it profitable sooner than yeah. sooner. I'm going to make soon. it. <laughs> he, he is. He's creating his ecosystem, and, it, it, yeah. and I can see everybody's spectating it. It's going to be profitable at some point. That's why mm. a lot of people will, um, pack, back, back them. A lot of businessmen back them. A lot of businessmen that have that they were not they were not announced back this takeover because these guys are specialized in making things profitable. He did it with PayPal. He did it with Tesla, and he could do. Oh yeah, he, he could do it with this one as well. But when it comes to Manchester United, the 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 the, the political side of, of that takeover, the interest from from Qatar matches the interests of uh, of the acquisitions that they have done before, and so many other businesses uh, across Europe and and the UK. Qatar looks for legacy, looks for trophy, looks for publicity, and Manchester United is going to absolutely achieve that mm. for them in, the, in the most easiest and convenient way as well. Another thing that uh, nobody's picking up on is um, B in Sports, which is Qatari-based uh, media company. Um, and they are planning to host a lot of NBA, you know, WWE, and cricket and all that stuff, right? Yeah. And Little Bird was whispering to me that like, when we're talking about sweetening the deals, meaning uh, undisclosed bidding, in a way, when you oversee the overall package, let me say that I would just use the analogy when I say potato farming, right? <laughs> so if the reports is correct, what the media is saying that, uh, you know, uh, the last roll of the dice from Ineos and Sir Ratcliffe, 
you know, it's just putting pu pushing it the final can to the cliff, right? Because if you are like a, what you say, a boyhood Manchester United fan, and you know you want to, your manifesto is to invest in the community, put it back to Manchester. Then coming out with this bid to say, well, I will keep the glazes like you know in a minority on twenty percent does not make sense. You know, you can just unpack it there, right? You can. Like hold my coffee, hold my beer, unpack it there, and the political and um, business suicide by doing so will be even harder. You can always see, like you know, people are now starting hashtag no no Jim Ratcliffe, no, no Glazers, you're know, the similar trader, blah blah blah, right? So just to take over on that negativity spell would damage your own business as Ineos, right? All right. So if you're a Glazers, you were giving the seeds and say, well, maybe within 15 years you might have a successful crop, but it all depends on the weather, if it rains, if it's sunshine and all that stuff, and depending on how the club is performing, or B, you have somebody with endless cash reserves and national resources to come and say, well, anyone that's been dealing with the Emiratis or local Qataris, they're not stupid. They, you know, they're shrewd businessmen, trust me. <laughs> My bosses used to be like that too. They will scrutinize every single deal and then they don't want to be taken to the dryers, they, you know, is what say we don't take us for hostage like manchester united said um they have the money to do like this right yeah. but you, you just don't pull your pants down to your ankle straight away and say here's habibi has seven billion on the table no you start you start small right but any instance if they get a warning sign that say well you current your bid is currently below the winning bid they can just go on 24 hours here's one billion more right and I will get to that point. I will get to the point because I lost my train of thought here. I mean, um, I, yeah, hmm? I mean, it, that, that's still too early for it because again, it is. What, what I feel it's it's more of a PR kind of kind kind of a um, a, a battle. It, it is a PR battle because things are not as clear as it should be. Not yet. It's not as clear as it, and that's why I say it's like a PR battle. It's like a slugfest when you have two heavyweights going for a match. And they're having a press conference and they're slagging each other off and we're yeah. gonna kick your ass yeah 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 and they slap each other it's kind of similar what you see here it's normal it's called gamemanship right yeah but then what's what's really eating me alive is the poor fan base that's already divided and conquered for for many years um by media because everyone wants this to happen is that you journalists are going out there and creating and fueling the fire right you know be more sensitive be more astute and what i'm trying to say to people is just relax calm just decision will come right but the fear of of uh, i mean we were kind of as a fans are entitled to do due diligence of the current bid right when i was speaking to phil brown the other day as well we we, we both came came to terms to say that if this was the only bid that was one year ago with Sir Jim Ratcliffe and just had glazes on 20%. Everyone would jump on the bandwagon, right? Yeah. But we have now two bids, which is offering 100%. And one is saying, <clears throat> you know, 20% with Sir Jim Ratcliffe and the glazes. But there's no, no doubt in my mind that whatever the glazes choose, the glazenomics talks, money talks, you follow the money, you know? No, well, not in not necessarily in that case because the differences are not really huge. Okay, this one, this break it down. Things, okay, this is mainly. I I would like to say this, and I know there's quite a big word and a big statement to, to put out there. The the takeover from Jim Ratcliffe is an existential threat to Manchester United, and I mean it. Existential threat to the future of Manchester United. Existential threat to the present of Manchester United. Existent, existential threat to everything good we hope for Manchester United and I know that would sound a bit biased looking at me being an Arab and all of that thinking that um, are you thinking that maybe that's my bias or something but it's actually not the case and I could simply unpack it by by saying that it's it will it will put the the future of the club on the edge and success in such a very competitive environment is not really guaranteed. I'm come a season, you might experience something similar to Liverpool, like a downtrend for a year or two. Even we had these downtrends during the most successful long term, long term, uh, 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 long term trend with Sir Alex Ferguson. You had a small downtrend. You had an opposite 
trend for some time. But if you put the equity in such a verge of a collapse under that much of financial distress, distress, you will not be able to survive a short term downtrend mm. because you will be always, always subject to, you know, you need that revenue that you will get from a continuous success, a continuous mm. qualifications to Champions League because first of all, the, the, the club will be bought in debt. You already have an existing debt. And also, if you want to improve the stadium and the infrastructure, that's another debt. If you want to purchase more players, that's other debt. The revenues are not going to be the same you're going through or you're going to get into recession very soon as well. So revenues, of the revenues are going to go down. Earnings are going to go down. So imagine your spendings are going to be more. You will have more premium and more royalties and bounties on, on whatever money you're going to borrow because it's the most expensive time to borrow money ever. But you will yeah. have to borrow money because there is no money for you to spend in order to be able to compete. That's the option number one. So you'll put the equity under so much financial distress. Or the second option is you operate it exactly the same way he's operating on Nice, like a mediocre middle table kind of a club. Mm. This is when this is when you can have it safe. You will not have success. You will not get where you want, but you will not be bankrupt. Um, when you come to uh, the mediocre club, so what you're trying to say is minimum investment into the club it's like you bought a ferrari right mm -hmm. but you don't put uh, enough fuel into the ferrari to be competitive to reach to uh, you know the, the finish line you put 80 you know ferrari needs 1995 mm. oh, in terms of uh, fuel yeah you put diesel in diesel yeah yeah oh. that's what that's basically what you're gonna do you you bought a ferrari and even in the case of jim jim ratcliffe he borrowed the money from a bank to buy the, the Ferrari. Mm. So he's been debt for the Ferrari or the Ferrari is 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 a debt, is a bond. And yeah. Yeah. Um you mentioned something that I forgot. Hold my beer on sorry, not beer, hold my coffee on on that mm. bond. But let's take the analogy of Ferrari, right? Okay. Yeah, everyone wants to buy that red Ferrari, the beautiful red devil Ferrari, right? Mm. Yeah. 100%. Instead of having the horse of the Ferrari, you put the devil on it, like the emblem yeah. of Manchester United, right? Everyone wants to buy it, of course. It's the most biggest club in the world, uh, generates a lot of money, like you know, internally as well. Yeah. We're sustainable enough to uh, be running on our own football operations. Um, but um, the thing is, right, you can buy this Ferrari, but how are you going to make it competitive, right? You don't have enough um, ingredients to to be competitive don't treat it like a mediocre club or you know or such a thing or you will have some somebody will have endless of resources to actually produce petrochemicals to buy that ferrari and keep r racing that ferrari and winning and winning and winning like you know lap after lap lap after lap lap after lap so this is the way i see it but um in terms of again what you mentioned bonds right bonds is something that Bank of America has been leveraging about you to, by allowing the Glazers to use overdrafts, right? Credit yeah. after credit. In transfer market has been using overdrafts and credit, right? They never dipped into their own pocket. But that bond has interest rate as well. So what I'm trying to say before is you got to look at who is actually profiting of this sale as well, right? It's not only the Rain Group, it's not only uh, the Glazers, but the Bank of America will get payout on that bond as well, right? They will also walk away with profit, correct? That's correct. Definitely. <laughs> Nobody yeah. gives money for free. Make it's, it's, a, it's a basic of every financial transaction. Nobody gives money for free. It's an interest-based economy in financial systems. Yeah, and it will remain um, um, as such. You know what? The, using the analogy of a Ferrari, the the Justin Benham takeover is literally like a man who bought the Ferrari from his own pocket, and also he owns a gas station. And gas station, true. And uh, thank you all for coming in. Thank you so much. You know. Um, it is green and gold until we sell, and we are coming to a, to a full sale. I, I don't see the other way. And whatever we're saying here, it's not, you know, it's not being that we are journalists or anything else. We are just a genuine community discussing. We are million supporters sitting in different positions like Ahmed itself, you know, working in the banking finance and stuff like that. So, guys, 
if you want to be part of the Manchester United MUC Real Estate TV community, please like and subscribe. It really helps the community for us to grow, to continue making this educational content. But also, you know, we are red. I mean, I, I'm patriot red, passionate red, close to my heart, man. <laughs> All we can say is we will give you back the day and thank you for tuning in. Thank you, Ahmed. Please, guys, be nice to each other on the socials. Don't fight. Take emotion sickness pills. And yeah, just smile. Be happy. Don't worry. Don't worry. Be happy. Cheers, guys. Cheers, thank everyone. you. <laughs> Time Take to go. go. Time to go. Bye. 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 Thank you so much for stopping by and watching MEFC Realist TV. Don't forget to like and subscribe and follow us on the socials.